I'm going to introduce our next speaker. She is Audrey Morrissey, <clears throat> the Associate Director of My Life, My Choice. <clears throat> She's been an integral part of the organization since 2003 and was the first commercial sexual exploitation survivor in Massachusetts to mentor commercially sexually exploited girls. Drawing from her personal experience, Morrissey has helped develop and lead survivor-led programs that aim to prevent the exploitation or re-victimization of vulnerable girls ages 12 to 18, reaching more than 200 girls annually. She has served as a consultant to the Administrative Office of the Trial Courts, redesigning the court's response to prostitution project, as well as the vice chair of the Survivor Services Task Force. Audrey. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm glad people were able to have their lunch. I had down, I was supposed to be here at 12.30, and they're like, no, at 12. And then when I was riding here, I'm like, no one wants to hear me at 12. People want to eat at 12. So it all worked out. So I'm really, I um, only have 20 minutes, and um, I was asked to, and I don't do this very often, but I was kind of asked to share about the realities of being in the life. And so I said, what reality would be the best reality for me to share would be my own reality and my own experiences. So I don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump right in. So I don't know if I'll cover all this. I know I won't in 20 minutes, but I'm going to um, try and go over at least my family, the recruitment and impact, and addiction, and getting out of the life. So there's the head of the family, right? There's my mother, who was definitely a... I hate to say this with a picture. I usually say this and there's no photo. But I always say, not to me, but that my mother was like the first bully I ever met. My mother's very intimidating. You know, I don't come from the DCF era. You know, I came from the era of children are to be seen and not heard. And um, it was played out in my home on a regular basis. Um, and to this day, Amanda is 76. I still do not mess with Amanda. She was hardcore, and, um, but her, her inability to kind of be nurturing and loving, and, and that was based on where she came from, right? So she came from a place where, again, that was even harder than the place where I came from. But I have to say her inability to show affection and love and nurturing, and I'm not saying she didn't love me, but in her mind, um, she would say things like, nobody's going to break their neck for you to know that they love you. Like for her, it was like, OK, if you give me a 22 and say, tell Audrey, either you blow your brains out or tell Audrey you love her, my mother probably would have picked up the 22. No, because that's where she came from. And I have to say, that had an impact on me. Um, and it really played a big part in me looking for love in all the wrong places. And so this is me, one Easter Sunday, awfully cute. One Easter Sunday, um, about probably was six years old at the time, very, very vulnerable. Um, at this time, had already had some experiences of sexual abuse um, in my life um, before, prior to taking this photo. So I want to talk a little bit about um, recruitment. And so this is myself, uh, my, my oldest daughter. At the time I took that photo, I was 16 years old. So I had a baby by the age of 16 and thought I was in love. And let me be honest with you, I was in love. I didn't think, right? Um, and so I, I include this picture because it probably wasn't long after this photo that I was recruited into the commercial sex industry. And so I come from a place here in Boston, those of us of a certain age remember the combat zone. 
And how recruitment began for me was it was based, you know, in the name of love. If you love me, you will do this, right? And for me, it was like I had a baby, um, and he used, that was a vulnerability that he took advantage of. And so my first experience of being in life, and it started off, it didn't start off with an introduction of being in the life. It started off with things like, will you steal me outfits? Will you go to the store and steal me sweatsuits, sneakers, et cetera? And um, I have to tell you all, I wasn't good at it. I was getting cases. I was getting busted all the time. And, um, and then from there, it was, if you really love me and you want to be with me, and for me, you and our daughter, to really live happily ever after with the promises of things, you will do this for me. And so I'll never forget um, the first time I was taken to the combat zone, I was put on a corner, and a car pulled up immediately, and as soon as I got in the car, he flashed me a badge, told me that he was a police officer, and told me that if I didn't give him a blow job, he would arrest me. And I share that to say, because I know we have a lot of people in the room with a lot of different opinions of, you know, the right to do, right? Uh, first of all, I'm going to say this. This is no place for children, number one. Number two, the adults that I work with who are still in the life, were, their stories were similar to mine, and they were brought in as kids. So they didn't have the ability to be sold as children and then as adults say, this is my right to do so. I was still stuck. By that time, my self-esteem was so low, I felt like, I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. So I like to tell you um, that that was it for me after this police officer flashed his badge. And I also want to add, you know, at that time, even if I didn't have a pimp, it was still a level of disrespect, being dehumanized, I wasn't seen as a person, you're a prostitute, and you're on the corner, and you need to serve me before I lock you up. And I have to tell you all, I cried like a baby. I'm talking snots boogers. You know the kind when you talk and you blow snot bubbles? And so he said to me, you know what? I'm going to give you a break. I'm going to let you go this time. Now, it probably wasn't because he was a nice guy. It was probably the snots and boogers, <laughs> right? So anyway, he let me out of the car. And I have to tell you all, after that, I swore I would never do anything like this again. My pimp came around the corner. I got in the car. I told him what happened. We went home. I didn't hear anything about it for a couple more weeks. And then he approached me again, and he basically said it was my fault. I should have told you what the vice cars look like. He said, I'll have you back. I'll stand across the street on the next corner. And needless to say, he lured me back into this, to the combat zone. And I also have to tell you all, I come from um, an area, I come from right around here, basically. And so the kids call me things like, white girl, pus color, is your father white? Are you a Puerto Rican? Where'd you get that white girl hair from? I'm also from the bussing era. So when I was with all the brown people, I was too light to be black. And when I went to school, they threw bricks at my school bus, called me the N-word, and then I was too light, too dark to be white. And so for me, when I ended up in the combat zone, what kept me stuck there was thinking this was the only place I fit in. For me, there was something to be said. I must be OK. People are giving me their money. Now, I'm not looking at the money going in one hand and out the other, but there was this false sense of self-esteem and self-worth that I had developed on the corners of the combat zone. Now, let me speed it up to. He went to jail about a year later. And again, it goes back to, because people like to use the word choice. By this time, I didn't think I People were talking really bad about me. People weren't saying, oh, what a nice career choice. We understand, right? So I got a bright idea, because now I'm on my own, and I'm smart, and I don't want another pimp. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start working in the strip clubs, because I know I can't work on the street corners because another pimp would grab me. So I went into, um, I worked just about every strip club in the combat zone. And I want to tell you, for some years, the pimp was gone. 
and I was definitely the one that was saying, I am getting money, and I don't give my money to pimps, thought this was my choice, and that I had it going on. And I really, truly believe that. And so I took a lot of years of abuse in the strip clubs, outside of strip clubs, because people don't talk about like a guy waiting in the parking lot that's obsessed with you, whether I'm doing it because I think I made a decision to, but I didn't make a decision for a guy to be waiting, stalking me in the parking lot when I would leave the strip clubs. But those are the things that happened. And as, as I stayed in the life, because I don't care, and I'll be here for a minute, and I'm down for a debate. I don't really give a shit. I'm in that kind of mood today, <laughs> right? Because what I want to say about that is I don't give a shit how I did it with a pimp, without a pimp, thinking I'm doing my own thing. Here's the piece I don't hear anybody talk about or any research on. What was it like three to five years after coming out of the life? What was that trauma like? Because I really thought I had it going. You all, I did, you know, for a minute. I did have it going on, right, until substance abuse came into the picture. And this is my daughter. And I don't, here's another thing. If somebody will come, listen, if there's someone that's in a life that's like, it's my choice, I love it, and you want to come to me and tell me um, that you do it because you love having sex, I'm open. That was the worst part of being in the life. I always say this to people. If you picture yourself with your partner, and your partner said to you, listen, I want you to have sex with me. I require, I require you have sex with me 10 to 20 times a day. I don't know about nobody in this room, but I would have got the hell away from him as fast as I possibly could. Now, also, if anyone in this room can pull that off, I'll be glad to hear about that. No judgment. No judgment, because I, I can't pull that off, right? So for me, when I say the trauma before addiction, one of the things I had to develop is how to disassociate, right? Meaning, if I'm having sex with someone, I couldn't be present in the moment. I wasn't doing it because I liked it. And then... Being in the strip clubs, you had to hustle drinks. You had to be a good mixer, right? So now, because when I got into life, I smoked a little weed. I can't tell you when I crossed the line from addiction. But anyway, I began in the strip clubs, the drinking. Then I get drunk. Somebody says, here, I have some cocaine. That'll wake you up. Oh, nice, right? And then that progressed into, um, okay, now I'm hyped. So here's some Valiums. And then around 20... I met, this is, uh, she's, she turned 28 yesterday. She'd be so cute. I have three daughters. I can't wait to show them all. <laughs> and when I met her father, again, walks through the strip club and says, and I was 20 at the time, he was about 36, and he came through and he said, oh, my God, I usually don't mess with strippers and hoes, but I like you. And I thought, oh, he likes me? And he was sharp, too, because that's my problem, too. I like when they look good. It always gets me caught up, right? So needless to say, when I met him, he introduced me to heroin, and which I found was a wonderful way to disassociate while turning tricks. This is, I am in heaven. And I need to share that by doing that, and getting high and was so caught up in the life that this baby was born addicted. And so when I had her, she was addicted to heroin, methadone. She was born no November 28th, 1989. She didn't get out of the hospital until uh, January. And um, every time they would bring her down off her medication, like, I'd visit her in the morning, and they'd say, okay, we're going to bring her down. And then I'd go back in the afternoon, and they're like, nope, we had to bump her butt back up. The withdrawal was that bad. And it was due to my addiction. And these were my realities of being in the life. And so, of course, at that time, um, they had just started 
it was filing 51 A's for women who had drug addicted babies. And I need to tell you, I talked a little trash about my mother, but I'm grateful for her at the same time, because if it were not for her taking care of my children, my children would have ended up in state custody. But it caused harm. And I need to tell you all, and I've been out of life almost 25 years, even the effects of being in the life 28 years later, I still see the effects of my substance abuse on this of the three of my children, the other two were not born addicted. This one took the heaviest hit, and I see the effects of it every time she's in my presence. And so those are my realities. And then I have to talk about like the progression of my addiction, being in the life, because I thought I was a star. I'm sure, you know, most people were in the life, depending on how much money you make, you think you're a star. So I lived in fantasy and illusion for a long time. But I need to talk about how my disease of addiction, how it progressed. How I went from like high end, getting money in the strip clubs, to selling myself for $5, in and out of detoxes. And I remember being in detoxes, and they would say, but you can't go back to that life. And I'd say, Oh, no, I get money. You all are mad because you don't make money, and you got to wait all week for a paycheck. Are you stupid? But I continued to go back to that area of the combat zone, and I continued to get what I always got. And I have to say, the rea realities of being in a life for me brought me to my knees. And one of the other things that I want to share is I ended up getting clean. I ended up going into treatment March March 26, 1993, I was 30 years old. I had been in life from 16 to 30. Had this child who was born addicted. Um, and I was pregnant again with my third child. I knew I didn't want to do this to another child, so I went into treatment. And it was after, and this is what I want to touch on, because we don't hear a lot about the after effects of being in the life, right? When I'm in it, I was the bomb. Particularly when I didn't have a pimp. Shoot, it's my right to sell my coochie. The rest of y'all are stupid because you gave your money away. Shit, my money's mine. No, and I believe that. I, but that's how I, right? And I also believed that those of you who go to work every day were the crazy ones. I'm like, they wait that long for a paycheck? I can make that in a day. But I went, when I got clean and I had, um, and I always share, but that's my little white baby. She's so cute. <laughs> So, no, seriously, I, I always talk about being from the hood and, and like when I train, and I, I remember when she was born and I looked, and you know, her dad's white, but I was like, oh, shit, she's really white. I thought, you know, I thought the chick was going to, you know, the little golden, you know, the little mixed kids. And, um, but anyway, that's my baby, and um, who, who is today finishing her master's degree from um, BU Occupational Therapy, who I'm quite proud of. But she's my recovery baby. And so I got clean, I went into treatment. Got clean. Somebody give me the five-minute sign, too. Um, so I got clean. It's my first. I got clean in um, March. She was born in October. This is the first Christmas that I was in recovery. Um, I have to tell you all, I knew nothing about parenting because that's another thing. And I don't hear people talk about after coming out of the life, whether you're doing it because it's my right to do so but how coming out of something like that, with or without the drugs, learning to live life on life's terms, like that stuff. Like, because when I was getting money before the disease really took control, I wasn't parenting any children. I wasn't doing none of that stuff. So when I got clean, people had to teach me how to parent my children. I was like, I got clean, I was like, oh my God, it's, there's three of them. And where the hell did they come from? Did I have three children? And um, I have to tell you, I always joke about this too. Um, I lived in a town, Brookline, and um, I ended up, my two children, um, my middle daughter and my baby are the two that I raised. My oldest daughter stayed with my mom. She was 14 when I got out of the life. Um, and the reality is, for me, people had to teach me how to parent my children. 
I didn't have a clue. Because I was just caught up in getting money. You know, it was all about me. You know, and even coming out of the life and parenting, it was still all about me. I was like, I would go to the, you know, and so other people, and I have to be honest, don't laugh you all, but this is my reality. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm telling you what really happened. I lived in a town, Brookline, and I started watching the white parents. I was like, shit, they, all the Jewish women, they kind of like their children. Their kids would fall out and stuff, and they would say things like, darling, get up. <laughs> well, I would say, if you don't get the F up right now, it's going to be a problem. Like, I didn't know, right? Because of, and I don't care the, the, the best John that I ever had, you know, those good regulars that was those well-to-do businessmen. Even they would say shit. I remember, you know what I remember uh, John saying to me once? Nobody will, nobody will ever marry you. You're a prostitute. I'll never forget that. I wish I could find him now and say, I've had two husbands since, and damn it, I don't want another one. <laughs> but I share this to say that my, the realities of being in life kicked my butt. Now, here's the heaviest hit that I took, because we won't be able to really look at any more slides. But the biggest hit. And this is what I want to address. And this is what any researchers in the room, and I'll be, listen, I'll be, a, I'll be one of your, you can use me if you like. Now, when I came out of the life, and I work with youth, and we all agree this is no place for children. But again, as I said earlier, these are children, like if they were being pimped from age 12 and now they're 18, believe me, they didn't go, it's my right, and right, it's a condition. They don't believe that they can. They believe, even if the pimp's gone, that, hey, I'm damaged goods. So, um, but what was my point? I had a point. What did I say before that? <laughs> I'm getting old, too. I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, the research. Because this is important. I remember when I started doing this work, and I remember saying to myself, why don't I like having sex anymore? I used to think I was like a little freak, right? But when I came out of the life, and then I, I was like, what is wrong? Do I need some drugs? What's the problem? It wasn't until I began working at My Life, My Choice. And we're located, for those who don't know, right at 989 Commonwealth Ave. And we have a training program. We have a mentoring program. We have prevention groups. And I remember getting in touch with my reality that I had developed dissociative disorder. And what I mean by that, it took a toll on me sleeping with man after man after, right? My body now, like sex is, I don't even know how to, let me just put it this way, I don't know how to have sex and be present, which has made it very difficult for me to really, that's probably why the two husbands are gone, I don't know, but I'm just saying, it has made it very difficult for me, I could be in love and and I know I look like a fabulous sexual being. <laughs> I know, I know. But the reality is of being in the life with or without a pimp, with or without drugs, choice or no choice, that will never go away from me. And I get emotional because no one talks about the effects what happens to them, and maybe some, you know, are still in and thinking, way, way to go, I'm doing my thing. But I like to check in with people that are doing their thing a few years from now and tell me what the effects and the realities of being in the life. So I'm going to stop, and I'm just going to thank you all for listening. Thank you. No, that was a lot. Oh, uh, good question. Here's what's changed. We were visible. When when children were brought into the life, 
a lot of times people can go through the combat zone and be like, oh, I seen your daughter in the combat zone. People saw us. What has changed now is it's gone indoors. It's all online. When I think of myself being, being on the street, let me just say this. If, I hadn't, if I'm not seen for a few days, people will ask about me. Have you seen Pumpkin around? Even the police, if they know they didn't arrest you, because back then they used to arrest and charge children with prostitution and women as well. Even the police might ask other girls, have you seen Pumpkin around? No, I haven't seen her around. What is happening now, and I work with youth, is that pimps are putting children in hotel rooms. He's the only one that knows she's in there. A stream of guys going in and out, buying her. And let me, let me ask you this. Do you think anyone ever stops the white male when he goes into a hotel and, and gets on an elevator and says, sir, do you have a room? Well, in the combat zone, sweetie, there were many times I went to hotels, the major hotels, and they said to me, miss, where you going? I'm like, to my room. Show me your key and show me an ID. I was always stopped. So the difference is, I feel like the children are in cells. I have the ability in the combat zone to walk the whole area, social, right? I can still talk to people, other girls and women in the life, right? So the difference now that it is gone indoors, and it is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. And another thing I'll say about the combat zone, it kept a lot of prominent people who didn't want to be buyers who didn't want to be seen, right, because it was a known area. Well, now with the Internet, they can go anywhere. And I went to this guy's a researcher's workshop. He did a, a thing on Backpage, and he had a map. And what he found is that most ads, people think ads, all the ads are in urban areas. He said most ads are in upper middle class white areas, and it gives buyers who normally wouldn't go in a known area the ability to buy in areas where they're not out of place. So it's just gone from visible to invisible. And so that's why people think um, that we don't have a problem with our children being sold. One more. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your story. Um, I'm really curious about how, whether through your own personal experience or through your work with My Life, My Choice, how you go about or how you went about talking to your children about your past, whether or not you did that, and how you encourage mothers who are in their process of recovery and, and working on, on their healing and mm -hmm. how to incorporate that into like building relationships with their kids and their families. Well, for me, uh, my oldest daughter already knew what I was doing because she... You know, her father, her father was my pimp, but even when he was long gone, like, it was apparent. I didn't even have the ability to hide it, to be honest with you. My other two children, my middle daughter was three years old um, when I got out of the life, so she has, doesn't remember. And my baby, um, again, was born in recovery. So they absolutely... My two children, I just told them. I mean, I couldn't hide it. I was doing this work after a while. And so I was on TV and, uh, you know, all this other stuff. Um, for me, it was easier to tell my younger children because technically the baby never lived through it. The three-year-old, although she was the one that took the biggest hit, um, had no memory. Um, I feel this way. I feel like it's up to an individual parent because there's some things, if you're not like a public figure, for me, I was like in the public. So I had to kind of tell my children. I didn't want them to, you know, to see me on the news and then they find out what I was doing. But for some um, parents, it's up to them. It's, it's individual. Um, I know for me, coming out of the life, I did need, a, I just needed assistance with like somebody teach me how to be a mother. And once I learned to be a mother and with the two children that I raised, um, with the help, um, they began to love me unconditionally. So at that point, and my youngest daughter, she'll come to things like this with me. And I remember the first time she heard me speak, and I said, you know, Nicole, were you all right? You know, are you okay with that? And she was like, why wouldn't I be? And of course, she's educated and, you know, um, non-judgmental. You know, she, no, she, oh, Lord. I mean, some of the stuff I probably, some of the things I probably shared with you all, if she was in the room, she would take me inside and say, Mommy, you shouldn't have said that. 
<laughs> she'd probably say something about when I said the white parents taught me how to, re you know, and, um, that she was very white. Like that stuff I would probably get a little talking to. And then I'll have to say, Nicole, I've been doing this shit for years, and I'm not changing, and it's working for me, right? And your reality is yours, and my reality is mine. But I think children knowing that is an individual thing, and I will say this. The mentors that work for us, if they have young children, before I hire them, I do tell them, like, listen, our agency, um, people know about us. I don't know how long you want to do this work, but working with our kids, you will be known as a survivor mentor. Because some of them are in, you know, um, going into social work, right, and they're going to leave and move on. And I have to be honest with them before they start that your children might hear about what you do, and is that something you, you're okay with? But I feel like if you're not, if I wasn't out here doing the work, um, I probably wouldn't have shared that. Like if my children didn't know, I probably I would have left it in the past. So that's an individual thing. So again, thank you. Thank you to Audrey, and I'm going to introduce our next speaker, um, Sharon Oslin. She's an associate professor of sociology at the University of California, Riverside, and the associate director of the Presley Center for Crime and Justice Studies. Much of her work focuses on crime and gender with a particular emphasis on sex work. She's the author of Leaving Prostitution, Getting Out, and Staying Out of Sex Work. She's currently working on a project that examines the ways in which gentrification impacts those engaged in the illicit shadow economy by drawing on the case of street-based sex workers in Washington, DC. Welcome. Uh, so I'm very uh, happy to be here, and I've learned so much, and I think the, the, the different presenters so far has re have really um, done an excellent job of exposing the contradictions and the nuances um, and even the tensions involved in research and practice uh, on commercial sex. So, um, so I hope to contribute uh, doing that myself um, and exposing some of these tensions uh, that exist. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, Professor Rothman and, and the Dean of the School and everybody else that helped organize this event. Um, I think it's been fabulous. And um, I, don't, I don't think there's enough of these interdisciplinary types of forums to um, hold these conversations. So to begin my talk, uh, I would like to very briefly recap the research I've done and uh, as a way to kind of expose my expertise um, in terms of research on this topic. So my book uh, examines how organizations, nonprofit organizations, impact desistance or exiting from street-based street sex work. Um, I've also, through uh, various other research projects, uh, focused on biological female or cis cisgender female, biological male, and trans sex workers. Um, all of my research thus far has focused on street-based sex work. Uh, and I've focused on some topics that relate to public health, but others not, not as much, um, including experiences with and resistance to violence, uh, identity change, entrance into uh, street-based sex work, stigma and management strategies, economic deprivation, and uh, my more recent project is on gentrification and um, outdoor commercial sex markets. So I'm really curious and interested in how urban changes um, alter the work in various ways, including risks, but also just uh, other aspects of the work itself. So in this talk, I'm, I will summarize research on sex work policy and health. I will identify unresolved tensions and weaknesses in the literature and the research and offer suggestions for improvement um, of the health for this population. So throughout this talk, um, when I discuss commercial sex and health, I focus specifically on individuals engaged in prostitution. Obviously, when we talk about sex work, it's, that can be an umbrella term to encompass many different um, aspects of the sex trade. But I'm specifically going to focus on uh, prostitution or sex work uh, when I say the word sex work. 
Uh, I also excluded a lot of studies when I go through this literature review um, that focus on trafficking. Uh, trafficking can be a very different uh, type of experience for individuals and as, uh, as some of the previous panelists have, have discussed. Um, it's often much more coercive and, and likely to have uh, much more extreme negative consequences for individuals potentially. So it's not easily co uh, comparable to non-trafficked individuals uh, in many cases. So throughout this talk, I will address the following questions. Uh, what aspects of health does research focus on and how does health vary across different groups of sex workers? What regulates sex work and health? Uh, do specific legal policies improve things for individuals in the commercial sex trade? And what altern alternatives exist or could exist that can address this population's health needs? How can we improve health for the most vulnerable of sex workers? And what methods appear to work best? And finally, what role does or can research play um, in this? And uh, be forewarned, I don't resolve these issues uh, by the end of this talk, but provide food for thought and possible ways to move forward on them. So what I found when I was reviewing the extensive literature is that um, a, a vast majority of it tends to focus on the following aspects of health. Uh, so we have, uh, when we have physical health, it's often focused on violence, uh, STIs and STDs, drug use uh, or addiction. And then we have, s and, and that's most of the work I would say, but then we also have some work that focuses on mental health, including um, depression, self-esteem, and some work on P uh, things like PTSD. But of course, as we know, these things are interrelated as well. Before I start to discuss policies as they can impact health, I first want to provide an overview of the research um, about the health of sex workers and note and point out these contradictory conclusions that we can draw if you're doing a review of what's been published. Uh, one thing that was apparent in this review is that the health outcomes vary considerably across different groups of sex workers. Um, this is based on various characteristics, social statuses, context, and work conditions. Uh, so in terms of violence um, we, and physical assault, we see significant differences based on these empirical studies and research um, according to uh, gender identity. So again, biological female, male, and trans sex workers. And so some studies find that violence is greatest uh, uh, or is reported uh, at higher rates among trans female sex workers um, compared to uh, cisgender or, or bio female and male workers. Others find that age is an important consideration when we talk about violence and, and rates of physical assault. Uh, younger workers may be more susceptible to violence, and this is possibly due to less experience and or engaging in riskier sex acts. So some studies find that. Other studies point out the differences across stroll and sector. So, uh, so most research concludes that the greatest risk of violence occurs in outdoor street-based sex work. Um, this is often also performed uh, by many individuals of color. Um, and so in contrast, we see a, no a number of studies find indoor work tends to be much safer due to greater regulation um, and screening uh, mechanisms within these or uh, organizations or um, uh, in indoor settings. Yet there's also some work that examines and compares violence across different types of strolls, which I find particularly interesting given I study uh, street-based sex work. And um, some, of these, uh, some of these studies find that uh, drug-related strolls have the highest rates of violence uh, for street sex workers, uh, likely due to substance use, which can impair one's ability to screen and vet clients. So this is not um, uh, a shocking finding, but it's interesting to compare and think about different types of strolls and, and the conditions and, and the character of these strolls. In short, studies that examine violence by location or context tend to find rates of, uh, rates of violence are tied to the autonomy of the sex worker. So the greater the autonomy um, over the work conditions and other things, the lower the risk of violence, at least at the street level. Drug use is another way that people measure um, health and, and risk. Uh, and so drug use, at least more addictive and less re recreational uh, drugs, are higher among uh, street, work, uh, street workers compared to indoor workers, studies find. Um, uh, uh, among uh, trans, 
female sex workers experience significantly higher risk for HIV uh, infection in comparison to biological male and female. So when we move to um, STIs and STDs, there's higher risks for certain groups over others. Uh, and street workers tend to experience um, or face great, much greater risk uh, compared to indoor workers in terms um, of uh, STIs and STDs as well. Uh, and then if we turn to mental health, studies find that depression rates uh, were high, uh, particularly high among trans sex workers. Um, and, and I would argue also and caution a little bit that this is uh, somewhat hard to disentangle from gender identity given the research that we know that there's high rates of discrimination and ha harassment, especially of trans individuals generally. So um, I think more research needs to be done here to disentangle the two. Um, other studies report higher levels of psychological distress, mental health issues among street workers, um, especially compared to indoor workers. And uh, some studies that focus on self-esteem show that, uh, that sex workers, um, uh, street-based workers, tend to be more negatively impacted in terms of their self-esteem compared to uh, indoor workers. So this research suggests, again, that certain groups are especially vulnerable um, for particular types of health risk compared to other groups. And I think this is something I will keep reiterating because often we don't grapple with these, these uh, differences or divergences and we lump uh, uh, sex workers together even at the street level as one uh, type of homogenous group. Uh, okay, so I'd like to... Um, I'd like to review and think about, uh, return to the theme of the symposium here, which is to consider how policies can impact commercial sex and health uh, for those involved. And I present arguments made for um, different types of, uh, of policies, and, uh, and these are based on research and empirical studies that have been done. So one approach is to maintain the status quo in the United States, which, which is to um, uphold the criminalization of those who engage in prostitution. So those who want to, um, uh, who, those who are against this practice want to re uh, and want to remove policies or alter policies that keep prostitution um, illegal argue that the current status um, exacerbates negative health co consequences uh, for sex workers. So it isolates workers and can drive them to operate in hidden, in hidden spaces. It can also increase violence and decrease safe sex practices. And it can also make public health strategies more difficult to apply to sex workers for fear of criminalization. Those who want to uphold the current status make different arguments and claim that if we were to remove this criminalized status, we would essentially exacerbate the harms uh, uh, to sex workers by making things easier for sex traffickers and uh, greater exploitation by pimps or managers. Um, it would ostensibly reduce risk for pimps and tra traffickers because when a man is seen with a woman or child, there's no evidence that a crime is being committed. Uh, the police need testimony from traumatized individuals who would be afraid of the traffickers um, to report it. So these are some arguments that, that say we should maintain the current practice for these reasons. It's in the best interest um, uh, of, uh, of those in involved in the trade. And then finally, some argue that it would drive up the, the number of sex workers uh, to increase demand because legalization or decriminal, decriminalization would reduce the stigma of purchasing sex itself. Another policy uh, consideration would be to decriminalize selling sex and, um, and making it illegal to purchase it. So, so others have already mentioned this model. Many of you are probably familiar with it or at least have heard of it because it gets a lot of press and attention. It's called the Swedish uh, model or the Nordic model. And, um, and Sweden was the first country to enact this type of practice, but other countries including Norway, Northern Ireland, France, and other places, uh, primarily in Europe, have also adopted it since then. Um, those who are, uh, are against or oppose this policy argue um, that it could exacerbate harms for sex workers who would go underground to avoid authorities to accommodate customer preferences and, because, and to uh, help protect customers because they are more at risk of being criminalized in, with this type of context. Um, also, it would cause sex workers uh, potentially to hurry through negotiations and offers them less time to screen, cli screen clients, which can increase the harms and the health risks th that they face. 
those who are for this type of model or proponents of this policy um, argue that by targeting prospective customers, it can increase uh, demand for and therefore number of sex workers um, and therefore lessen exploitation and victimization. Also, it could make things better for sex workers because it does not criminalize them, but works towards the ab greater abolition of the market of prostitution and the sex trade. If we turn to a policy of decriminalization or legalization of prostitution, so if we consider that model instead, as that could potentially affect health, um, we know that, and I wanted to quickly point out the differences between the two um, in case some uh, folks are unaware, uh, but formal regulation is what essentially distinguishes the legalization from de decriminalization. So this would include things like uh, geographical restrictions, health requirements, age restrictions, registration, taxation, and so forth. Uh, so examples of countries where prostitution is decriminalized or legalized uh, is Germany, Netherlands, parts of Australia, New Zealand, and other places as well. So those who oppose this or argue against this policy um, are, would, would suggest uh, and, and contend that decriminalization and legalization would essentially escalate harms for this population. Uh, for instance, some have argued that decriminalizing sex work, work would harm the workers uh, because they would have a green light by the state and cannot discriminate against customers. There is no regulation about the type of sex work that they would have to engage in. It will increase sex trafficking because of increased demands as the stigma of purchasing sex is lessened. Yet to me, at least, it is not clear how under a decriminalized system, sex workers would be unable to discriminate um, against customers or have some sort of preference. Um, so assuming it would green light things, um, I would say is perhaps an overstatement given the differences between a decriminalization and legalization um, in different contexts. So proponents who favor this policy contend it would instill better regulation for the workers, um, enhanced safety uh, mechanisms, and uh, a proportion of lower risk clients in these kinds of contexts. It could also decrease uh, STIs, uh, STDs, and HIV rates by mandatory tests um, or increase condom use. Um, and, and Barb earlier talked about this in the context of legalized brothels in Nevada. Um, it would also enable better stigma management techniques by reframing it as work rather than a crime potentially. And it could reduce violence because it would allow for better screening, safety methods, encourage sex worker reporting to the police, um, at, or at least a mechanism to do so, um, and, and other things as well. So, so proponents would argue for these benefits of doing so. So after I reviewed all of these different uh, studies, and there's a plenty of them out there, um, I thought about some of the limitations of these studies in this body of work together. And one thing that I noticed is that most of these studies are done in one context. They're not comparative. Um, and, and if we are to review comparative studies, um, I believe we can better tease out how the different legal statuses can, uh, or conditions can directly impact the health of this population. And so this, there's one study that I found that I think is, is particularly interesting because it tries, it attempts to do this. So uh, in this study um, that compares three different legal settings and the effects on sex worker health um, by focusing on three cities in Australia, so Melbourne, Sydney, and Perth, um, and it focuses on health and safety measurements, including condom dis distribution, health promotion by staff, uh, quantity of out outreach educators, uh, room alarms, security cameras, and other things. Um, and Harcourt et al. provide the following results based on their comparative studies of, um, of uh, brothel work um, within three different cities uh, with different kinds of legal policy contexts. So in the legalized context with licensed brothels, um, they, they find that they have the highest rates for occupational health and safety, uh, likely due to the conditions of licensing. So they're more worker friendly overall. Uh, they provide better access to condoms for the workers, um, and they have uh, high access for health work, external health workers to come into these settings. They also found that in Melbourne, unlicensed brothels in this setting had much lower uh, safety levels due to criminalization. So that was a direct contrast there. 
If we turn to when they turn to the decriminalized context with no licensing for brothels, and this was in Sydney, um, what they found was uh, that it had uh, pretty high levels um, overall of uh, occupational health and safety, not quite as high as Melbourne, um, and uh, but but overall it was pretty good, and then they had a. Uh, the best access, reported best access to brothels uh, for outreach workers in this setting. And then the last setting, Perth, which was a criminalized context and brothels were illegal, um, they had the lowest health, reported health and safety level, levels. And this is based on the lowest levels of free condom distribution um, at brothels, fewest alarms and security cameras, fewest visits by health promotion staff, lowest access of health outreach workers. So this is, I, I realize, one study, but I think it's fruitful in that it com directly compares um, different contexts and, and kind of helps to tease out a little bit um, how policy is connected to direct health effects, at least in, in this particular study. Uh, okay, so I think that we hear often that scholars are increasingly calling for structural interve interventions to improve health of sex workers, and people uh, who spoke previously also talked about these, the structural importance of structural change. Um, and I think turning to the U.S., where prostitution is illegal, uh, with, of course, the few exceptions in Nevada brothels, um, I was thinking, how likely are policy changes? How realistic is this, really? Uh, and what, could t uh, what conditions have the potential to spur them or to generate such changes? To speculate, we can draw on a psychologist, Simon Letton's 2004 argument for conditions that would increase chances of decriminalization or legalization of marijuana. So I realize the study is now quite dated, given the changes in terms of decriminalization or legalization of marijuana. But I think some of the conditions that he points out might be useful as a thought experiment to apply to a policy change regarding prostitution in the United States. So one condition um, he argued needed to, to be in place to change uh, dec legalization or decriminalization of marijuana included um, having the majority support of the public. He also talked about survivability for politicians, in, which referred to they can remain in the position if they indeed support it publicly, um, broad consumer support for such cha policy changes, and evidence that harms are greater under criminal criminality criminalization um, compared to decriminalization or legalization. And so, of course, this is not an exhaustive list, but I think, again, it's a useful thought experiment to gauge the conditions, these conditions, as they may hold for changing policy regarding um, prostitution in the United States. So returning to point one, majority support of public, uh, we see that if we look at polls over time, we see that this is starting to change. So attitudes about legalization of prostitution in the United States are starting to change. Um, it's a slow change, but, but significant change over the past 10 to 15 years. So one poll, a YouGov poll in 2015, finds that 46% uh, percent of Americans think that prostitution should be illegal, while 44% think it should be legal now. So it's pretty, it's getting pretty close um, and has and has changed, uh, again, significantly in the last 10 to 15 years um, from previous polls. Uh, so points two and three, the survivability of politicians and broad consumer support. This is likely, I would say, no at this time. Um, most Americans, 64%, think that it's morally wrong to solicit uh, the services of a sex worker. So we still have pretty strong, um, uh, you know, reluctance of consumer support for such changes. And uh, it's also probably not very likely that uh, there'd be significant ba backlash for politicians to actively endorse, um, you know, decriminalization or legalization at this time. And then point four, the evidence of harms are greater under criminalization. There's growing research that documents this, um, and some folks have previously spoke about this, but yet this is still um, hotly debated and contested. Uh, so in short, overall, if we consider these, these conditions, they're likely, um, they're largely unmet at this time. So we're not likely to see uh, any policy changes um, regarding this anytime soon. So what do we do with the current policy then? Um, how can we address the health needs and concerns um, of, of street-based sex workers and sex especially, but sex workers overall? Uh, and so the illegal status is, is here for the uh, foreseeable future, certainly. Um, and so how can we realistically address the health concerns? 
Um, and what, what researchers have found so far is that the criminalization of prostitution actually creates many barriers to obtaining health services for this population. So empirical studies reveal that these barriers include uh, avoidance of settings where services are available in some cases, and this could be possibly due to high police presence or high risk of violence in those settings where services are available or clinics are available. Uh, restrictive rules of service provision agencies and organizations. So in some cases, if they're too restrictive or um, too strict, this may de deter individuals from, from using those services. So one example could be um, if they're a religious-based organization that they don't, they do not provide condoms or distribute condoms for, um, for you know, ideological reasons, um, and so this this could obviously um, not work for some individuals and would deter some individuals from going to that organization. And finally, um, heightened uh, stigma for sex workers um, they could face if they would go to certain clinics or organizations or have that affiliation. So how can we think differently about addressing health needs and, and risks, given the current system that we have? One thing I would argue we can do, and that's very important to do, is to collect better data. Uh, we can collect better data in order to gain more comprehensive knowledge about the health needs um, of this population. So. Um, I would argue that the street-based uh, work have the greatest health risks and needs um, uh, based on empirical research that, that we know about, um, and so that would be a particularly vulnerable group. Uh, one of the biggest impediments to enhanced data is accessing diverse groups of sex, sex workers, though, uh, particularly in contexts where it is a crime. Um, so, so what we need to do um, is to have more comparative knowledge and research, uh, like the study that, uh, that I previously reviewed. Uh, but what I think would be particularly helpful would be to have uh, research that focuses across or, and compares across groups within one location. So this could be um, individuals across gender identities, across racial ethnic groups, across age, across sectors um, within one location, one city would be particularly fruitful. We don't see many studies that do that. Um, we could also uh, have studies that focus across groups and contexts with different policies, so legal versus illegal, like the previous study um, that was done in different cities in Australia. I think that would be uh, provide us really insightful information and knowledge about specific identifying specific health needs. We also, uh, I would I would say, need better tri triangulation of data. So many of the studies, as I was reviewing them, are folk, you know include surveys or interviews and have our case studies, and that's great. But I think if we have a triangulation of data and focus on surveys and interviews and observations, potentially we have much stronger data and much stronger external validity. And I think that this could push our knowledge base about health needs and risks and concerns as researchers. So another thing um, that we can do to, to address the health needs is to expand the quantity and quality of programs that offer health services specifically for sex workers. So there are a limited number of clinics or health service organizations within the United States that specifically uh, focus on this population. So of course, sex workers can go to a variety of different clinics or health services, um, but based on some of the research I've done, uh, there are programs that, that target this population specifically, and they argue that this population has unique health needs um, that, are, that are specific to them, uh, particularly given the high rates of stigma and criminalization that they experience as a group. What I've found in my research is that there's um, at least 40, uh, but probably more programs like this in, in the United States uh, that provide services for sex workers. Um, and they have great variance in terms of what they provide. Uh, sometimes it's very hard to locate and find these programs, uh, but I have located at least uh, 40 of them. But there's lots of ebbs and flows in terms of because they're contingent on funding. So many of them close or new ones uh, pop up. So this is always kind of a changing number. 
I would argue that we need uh, holistic programs that provide comprehensive services that address the physical and mental health of sex workers, um, as well as, as as best as possible to address other conditions that have potential to directly affect health, such as lack of housing is a very important um, pressing issue. Unique programs are important uh, for this population because this group, as I said, experiences very high levels of stigma and criminaliz criminalization in the United States based upon their participation. And once you have that, it's very hard to shed. It's hard to get other types of employment, um, access to social services sometimes, and so forth. So this makes them particularly vulnerable. And the street-based sex workers tend to be those targeted most for crim criminali criminalization. Okay, so we can also do a better job, I would say, of finding and educated sex workers um, and getting them connected to comprehensive self, uh, services, health services because many of them report ignorance about these programs. Um, what I've found in my research is that um, a number of sex workers I've talked to did not even know of such programs in the city where they lived their whole lives or had worked their whole lives. So part of the problem is a disconnect between getting this information out that there are services, harm reduction services, um, within the city that you live in for you, potentially, if you want to use them. So I found in some of my research that um, many sex street-based sex workers told me that they learned about such programs um, in their city through professionals or other staff uh, members affiliated with institutions that they came into contact with, so this could include prisons, um, it, it, uh, it could include social workers, attorneys, even police officers in some cases would tell them and educate them about these services or programs. They would also learn about some of these programs through family members or friends at times, through media ads if the programs um, advertise themselves, uh, but also through program recruitment or outreach, out, out, outreach efforts uh, where they would go into sometimes jails or prisons um, or different uh, institutions or organizations. So getting the word out about these programs or clinics or health services that are available to sex workers can be an important component to improving health. We can also provide more mobile outreach, and I think this is one of the, the most important things, in my opinion, um, but we need more research to really to, to establish this. But uh, meeting people where they're at when they're there, I think this is key. Um, a few studies have been done on this, and one study in particular on cocaine-dependent women in, in the street-based sex work industry. Um, researchers found that conventional HIV prevention services did outreach during the daytime, and therefore were not especially effective accessing the population who work, shockingly, at night, largely. So uh, this is a big disconnect. Um, another study found that fixed location clinical services were less able to meet the health needs um, of target communities of sex workers. Um, and instead, what, what an alternative to that is mobile units that could come to them and meet them where they're at. And these uh, appear to be much more effective at providing um, health services. So one uh, East Coast program that I'm familiar with conducts mobile van out night outreach multiple times per week. Um, and they drive to select strolls in the city to provide an array of harm reduction services to street-based sex workers. And in the process, they're building rapport with this population. Uh, they do things like uh, distribute condoms, syringes, inquire about health, exchange information, um, connect them to other social service programs, and so on. And what they're doing here is a quite informal acquiring knowledge of the types of needs sex workers in their city want um, and they they modify the program accordingly to provide at the best of their ability these types of um, uh, uh, these types of needs and they also find that different stroll locations individuals in different strolls have different needs and so they tailor it accordingly um, depending on the stroll location Past studies also argue that peer education, peer advocacy could be especially effective for harm reduction. So health service providers can implement peer education and advocacy. One way they can do that, I should say, is by hiring former and current sex workers to vouch for program and staff, um, to provide feedback for staff to improve services so those on the ground um, can really be great um, uh, uh, conduits to the population and provide good feedback to health providers. We can use data collected on, uh, collected on this by uh, 
to compare different outreach techniques, so mobile outreach versus peer advocacy, and then assess the efficacy of various health services, including treating, preventing disease, addressing violence, mental health care, and so on. If different agencies share information, this could also lead to more interagency cooperation and coordination. Um, this would help better serve and protect sex workers. So one example um, is if nonprofits collect uh, bad date sheets, and some do, um, for, from sex workers, they can make this information public while keeping identity confidential. And they could share this with other sex workers, um, with researchers, uh, other social service agencies, and even the police um, to, to alert people about certain perpetrators of violence who are often repeat offenders um, and, and create an awareness and protection for, for sex workers. If you're not familiar, bad date sheets are a, essentially a report that includes a brief description of the perpetrator, the violent encounter, the vehicle description, and license plate, uh, if they have it, where the client and sex worker met, and, um, and what, the, uh, what, in, what happened during the encounter. And that way, violent perpetrators, who are typically often customers, may be held more accountable and even investigated or prosecuted, potentially, should this information be shared with police or law enforcement. This could help sex workers feel safer and have a heightened sense of autonomy to report bad dates to the police rather than feeling that they are unable to do so because they'd be criminalized in the process. Um, and this could potentially dampen and repeat violent uh, future encounters by the same perpetrator. So moving forward and in summary, um, I, I argue that we can collect, we can do a better job collecting data. Um, and this would help us identify the greatest need across diverse groups of sex workers. Again, it's not, uh, sex workers are not a homogenous group. Even if you look at a particular sector, like the street sector, we see quite a lot of variance, um, as, I was, uh, as I was showing based on my assessment of the literature. And I also think that this is where public health scholars, criminologists, sociologists, and other scholars uh, can work together to address their multi-pronged needs um, and devise recommendations for best, best practices for harm reduction. Then scholars can disseminate these findings and studies to community groups, nonprofit agencies, social service agencies, um, so they're aware of the health needs um, and tailor their services accordingly to best address uh, what the population needs um, and, and what could be most effective for them. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Are there any questions? The phone called Ugly Mug. Yes. Have you seen anything like that in the event? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I have, I'm not aware of anything like that in, in the United States, although some harm reduction programs are talking about develop, you know, dream about developing an app where you could uh, in, in real time upload information, basically be a virtual bad date sheet um, that could be constantly updated. Uh, but I don't know of anything like that in the United States. But that, but that is something that, yeah, many people talk about in the UK that has been helpful. Other questions? Thanks. So, um, I'm going to introduce our uh, next speaker, and our next speaker is Bobby Taylor, the chair of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition, uh, serves as the trans rights activist and public educator. Mix Taylor is also a member of the Massachusetts State Commission on Unaccompanied Homeless Youth, the Fenway Board of Visitors, and the Massachusetts Sex Worker Ally Network. 
a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a master's degree in social work, Mix Taylor has also served with such organizations as the Northwest AIDS Foundation, the Seattle Crisis Clinic, and the Boston Bisexual Resource Center. As a parent, partner, and community member, Mix Taylor shares in the work of advancing policies and practices that embrace social justice, racial awareness, intersectionality, and feminist values. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Dean Glass, Professor Rothman, and everyone for being here and for this awesome symposium. I want to say right up front, I am not a researcher. I am a community advocate and trans rights activist. I will speak uh, from my own perspectives and the narratives that I hear from the communities that I represent. So let me start by explaining the intersection of which I stand and the various identities, identities and roles that shape my perspectives on commercial sex policy. <clears throat> as well as being a parent partner and homemaker, I also identify as transgender, as someone whose gender is other than that which they were assigned at birth. In my case, I was assigned male at birth, but I identify as gender queer or non-binary. My preferred pronouns are she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs. I also identify as bisexual, or as I sometimes put it, pan slash poly slash bisexual slash queer. And I say this because language is both important and evolving. Uh, so there are terms that resonate well in the trans community, like cisgender, um, a cisgender male or female versus bio male or female. Um, I also engage in polyamory, uh, which is a form of ethical non-monogamy, and I have multiple partners. These types of non-monogamous relationship structures have only recently begun to gain visibility in popular culture and emerge as a topic in mainstream social discourse. In a culture that privileges monogamy, these types of relationships face both legal and social discrimination. And finally, I also engage in BDSM. For those not familiar with the acronym, it originally stood for bondage, discipline, and sadomasochism. Uh, and includes a variety of sexual practices outside of what we in the community would call the plain vanilla. Uh, set. Here in the state of Massachusetts, BDSM is illegal. I bring these aspects of my identity up because visibility is important, and nowhere is this more challenging for us as a society than in the areas of gender and sexuality. For those of us who are transgender, for those of us who are queer, for those of us who engage in sex work, Facing down stigma and discrimination is a part of our daily struggle. This is part of why I am involved with the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition, uh, MTPC. Our mission is to end discrimination on the basis of gender identity and, and expression here in the state of Massachusetts. And much of our work is focused on lifting up the voices of the trans community, particularly those most at risk, trans people of color and trans youth. I am also a member of the Massachusetts Sex Worker Ally Network, or MASWAN. MASWAN is an ally organization made up of academics, researchers, psychologists, and others who are dedicated to advancing the safety, dignity, and self-determination of sex workers in their work and in our communities. What led me to get involved in MASWAN started with a panel presentation that I attended at the Philadelphia Transgender Health Conference several years ago. It's an annual conference that draws thousands of people from around the globe. And this particular panel session was on the risks and realities of sex work for trans-identified individuals. A young trans woman of color who was both a sex worker and a leader in her community made the comment that she was five times more likely to suffer violence at the hands of the police 
than she was with her clients. While this wasn't entirely new to me, it was the first time I had heard it directly from someone for whom this was their lived reality in their own words. And this comment of hers was echoed by each of the other panelists. Each talked about their own experiences, their reasons for choosing to engage in sex work, the impact of anti-trafficking laws, and that the greatest risks for violence and sexual assault came not from their clients, but from the police. For many who identify as transgender, human rights get lost at this intersection of discrimination, sex work, law enforcement, and anti-trafficking in initiatives. Although advances are being made in the visibility, acceptance, and rights being afforded transgender individuals in the U.S., we still have a long way to go. We still remain at far higher risk for discrimination and violence, and in many places we face continuing barriers to housing, employment, education, and social services. According to the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, nearly one-third of respondents were living in poverty compared to 14% in the US, U.S. population overall, with a 15% unemployment rate three times higher than the general population. 12% reported in engaging in sex work at some point in their lives, with 9% having engaged in sex work in the past year. Also at the time of the survey, within the past year, of the respondents who interacted with the police or law enforcement officers who thought or knew they were transgender, more than half experienced some form of mistreatment. As well as being verbally harassed, repeatedly referred to by the wrong gender and physically assaulted, this also included being sexually assaulted, included being forced by officers to engage in sexual activity to avoid arrest. For many in the trans community and for many in marginalized communities in general, sex work is a way to make money, to make ends meet, to get by and get on with the business of life. For many, it's a path chosen for a variety of reasons, and it's worked. Like farm labor, domestic service, and manufacturing like psychotherapy, academia, and acting. Sex work is work. There is no debate about whether trafficking people for sex work is a violation of human rights. Forced labor of any kind is a violation of human rights, whatever the nature of the work. And human trafficking extends far beyond sex work. To quote the Council on Hemispheric Affairs in a report from July of last year, while stories about human trafficking often focus on sex trafficking, trafficking extends far beyond the sex trade. One area often overlooked in the public media is the use of human trafficking to supplement a scarce labor force in agriculture, a problem that entangles the United States with Mexico and Central America. These issues of exploitation and trafficking indicate that the current immigrant and labor laws of the United States help to create and sustain human trafficking networks that extend into Mexico and Central America. Elsewhere, from a report by NPR, entitled Beyond Brothels, Farms and Fisheries Are Frontiers of Human Trafficking. The author writes, we've seen a recognition that issues of labor trafficking work their way into goods and products and services we purchase every day as consumers, says Killian Moot, project director of Know the Chain. 
And once you start looking at the supply chains most likely to have trafficked workers, you find that a striking number are producing food. And finally, from an article in the Christian Science Monitor from October of 2015, Labor Trafficking is Everywhere and Nowhere, the author writes, although many of these workers are in a sense invisible, hidden in farm barracks and individual homes, a huge number work in plain sight. They mow grass for landscaping crews, clean dishes in restaurant kitchens, paint toenails in salons, and clean hotels and bathrooms. And that is just in the United States. Look globally, and labor trafficking shows up in supply chains for numerous products from automobiles to electronics to pet food. I would argue that the debate is about the ways that we as a society cont control who has autonomy in their life choices, sovereignty over their own body, and access to gainful employment that pays living wages. The sex worker at the Philadelphia Transgender Health Conference was not a victim of trafficking. She was an articulate, intelligent individual and a leader in her community, getting on with the business of her life. Arresting individuals such as herself does nothing to end trafficking. Our being seen and affirmed by others is crucial to our health and well-being both individually and as communities. It is crucial to understand our choices about how we conduct our lives. By enforcing anti-trafficking laws that target sex workers specifically, I would argue that rather than addressing the problem of human trafficking, we are actually perpetuating it. And in the process, we are perpetuating the stigma and discrimination that silences people's people, and communities. I think the time has come to examine our moral values and judgments regarding sex work and the very premise that it should be illegal. We need to listen to inv individuals who engage in sex work, to hear it directly from those for whom this is their lived reality in their own words. To that end, I would like to close with two quotes. The first is from someone who was trafficked and chose to continue with sex work after escaping her trafficker. And I quote, I have been trafficked by Mexican cartels, and I can tell you that sex work on your own is different because I have control over who, what, where, and when. It is completely different from being forced by an organization of violent and cruel people. I can see the argument that I am coerced into sex work because I need the money. But it's not like I have this uncontrollable compulsion to obtain the money. I am actively choosing to do this work. Like, just like someone could choose to eat a burrito versus a hamburger. You need to eat either way. I'm just choosing to do sex work instead of working at Target. The outcome is the same. I have the money. And from another sex worker and community advocate, I quote, I am perfectly capable of weighing the risks. It can be a shitty job. To pretend that gender exploitation isn't a factor is dumb. But I need people to stop asking me why I do it and start asking, is this your best option? Because I'm not dumb. I'm poor, not stupid. I know the risks. And this is the best option. And sending in men with guns, the police, to take away my best option and force me into programs where I have no control over my own fate does not make anything better. With sex work, I have money, and I can still have a life. The upside is money and time. I want to get my degree 
and work my way out of homelessness. Now I have housing and I am close to graduation. This would not have been possible with a job at Starbucks. I think we need to hear more voices such as these. The fact that sex work is criminalized makes it difficult to hear these voices. But we can no longer remain silent. As we are doing in the area of LGBT rights, we as a society need to move beyond the mentality of criminalization. When I was born, the term genderqueer had not yet come into use, and the sexuality that I would eventually grow into was illegal. Things change. We can change how we look at sex work. The question is whether we help them change for the better. Thank you. Couple questions. Question. Yep. Hi. Thank you so much for that. That was really great. Um, I think one voice we haven't heard in this room today is that of the um, upscale or escort market of escorts. And I was just wondering if, in your travels, you've encountered any of those people and talked to them about why they chose that work or. Anything. Yes, I can speak to that some. Um, and there are several individuals I know in particular. Um, in fact, one who I went to school with back in college, um, engaged in sex work, and uh, <laughs> very intelligent, upper middle class, white, came from an affluent neighborhood. Um, they enjoyed the work. They made money. After, after we both graduated, um, the money that they had earned, they folded into a retail business, which continues on to this day. It was really kind of astounding. Um, I guess there are a couple things that come to mind. One is that we have stereotypes of sex workers as all coming from um, shall I say, highly oppressed communities. Uh, that is not the case. Uh, there are, I, you know, I talk about sex work being work and being a choice, and some people um, have relatively few choices at hand and choose sex work. Some people have a lot of choices at hand, and they choose to engage in sex work, and they choose to engage in sex work. And, um, I mean, one of the stories that I heard that I was really struck by, and it was reflected in someone's presentation earlier today, about how sometimes it's more of a therapeutic process um, than a sexual one. Um, yeah. Does, does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, speak to some of the local efforts around advocacy that are happening, uh, specifically in Boston, Massachusetts. So I'm involved with this group called the Massachusetts Sex Worker Ally Network. Uh, if you want to look it up online, uh, the URL is massachusettsswan.org. Um, it's, I think we're about a year old at this point. We're really st still in the stages of formation. Um, as an ally network, we act as the public-facing side of the effort to support sex workers and to work on decriminalization. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, first of all, for including the voices of sex workers in your talk. I thought that was really powerful. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about um, sort of differences in experience between 
um, say, trans women sex workers, cis men sex workers, cis women sex workers, in your experience, um, especially since the stereotypical depiction of sex work so often focuses on sort of cis women in high heels um, and not so much on the experience of trans sex workers? Uh, the thing that comes to mind is the element of risk. Um, with the trans population, we're already dealing with risk levels several times higher just in our normal day-to-day -day living in terms of issues like depression, threat of physical violence, things like that. Uh, engaging in sex work uh, makes everything, makes all those risks more prominent. Um, yeah. I don't know that I have a whole lot more to say about that. Anything else? Yep. Oh, yeah. Mike. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, some of us choose jobs that are more risky than others. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I can't imagine working as a police officer, for example. You're not going to find me in the military for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know, risk is an issue there. I would not do construction work on high rises, things like that. Um, yeah, I, some of us thrive on risks. And I mean, you know, in my kink, I take my own <laughs> risks, as it were. Um, yeah, it's a matter of personal preferences. And personal preference and autonomy, the freedom to make the choice, to say, yes, I'm willing to engage in this. No, I don't want to engage in that. I, I wouldn't say that's not ever an issue. I'm kind of thinking that's an issue for all of us and how our communities shape us and what, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, what we can do and can't do. So why might a person stay in a domestic violence situation? Um, why might someone stay why might someone not apply to college, for example? Uh, all sorts of things. Uh, I, sex work is not inherently a bad choice. OK. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Um, thank you. And for those following along with our agenda, we're now um, back on our original schedule. We have two remaining speakers. And so it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Michael Shively. He is the senior associate at Apt Associates, a US-based public policy research firm. His work on human trafficking includes directing studies of victimization, perpetration, and system responses for the US Department of Justice, US Department of State, and private foundation. He is currently directing the development of a methodology for producing valid uh, county-level estimates of human trafficking victim prevalence and is a task leader on a study of federal processing of human trafficking cases from investigation and prosecution 
through sentencing, incarceration, and community reentry. He recently completed a study of human traffickers, organizations, and facilitators that examined the structure and operation of criminal enterprises. Um, and he currently operates the Demand Forum website, which documents prostitution and sex trafficking prevention interventions in more than 1,200 communities throughout the United States. So, welcome. So, um, I come from a different background, different perspective, uh, academically, you know, and professionally. So, you know, this is a public health school. Uh, this is largely a public health professional, advocate, student sort of audience. Um, and uh, some of the artifacts of my background are going to be terminology. Um, the work I've done for the U.S. Department of Justice, if I were to use the term sex work, I would be like ridden out of the whole process on a rail. Um, if I don't use the term sex work in other contexts, you get ridden out there for, for that reason. So I, I kind of can't figure it out or pick. So what I've, I, I use both and it's just going to be enough to annoy absolutely everyone. Um, and satisfy no one, but um, I'm sort of caught between worlds right now in terms of terminology. Um, I am just like painfully uninteresting as, you know, so I'm not going to go into a biography. I, this, this panel, they're just so diverse and interesting and I just like, I'm a middle-aged white guy. I don't know what else to tell you. Um, you know, so there we go. Um, so, uh, this, this I, I would, to do it over, I would name this presentation a little bit differently. Th this is broader than I'm actually going to take on. Um, decriminalize prostitution, improve public health, and advance human rights. I'm really talking about one little piece of that argument, and even more narrow, I'm talking about one study about that piece of the argument. So um, don't think I'm going to, you know, try to lead you to some sort of solution to this whole debate or anything like that. Um, so, um, you know, we've been through this, you know, all day long, just talking about there are different, you know, camps, different, you know, ideologies, different um, experiences. Uh, some of them are just, you know, personal, um, driven by biography and, and experience, and others are institutionalized. Um, different legal frameworks in different countries, and even here in the U.S., uh, the U.S. justice world, uh, is uh, abolitionist. The laws are prohibitionist about all all sex work and commercial sex. Um, you know, so everything follows from that. The types of programs, the types of research that gets funded about the types of approaches is all within the framework of prohibition. Uh, but global public health um, tends toward, uh, you know, much more towards uh, a decriminalization and harm reduction sort of a model. So. You know, it's debates all over the place, you know. So one of, one of the, the pieces of the debate, there are all, you know, there's human rights arguments, there's all kinds of pieces to the argument. Um, but this one piece of it is very, very important, and that is, um, you know, which legal frameworks are actually going to help you in a, in a tangible, measurable, verifiable kind of way to improve health outcomes, right? And... Um, so I'm looking at, there's research on whether decriminalization is a helpful thing uh, to, in the prevention or the fight to prevent the transmission of HIV, right? And uh, there was a special edition of Lancet, and it was interesting, our first two speakers today actually showed slides and referenced the study I'm going to focus on. And uh, actually one of the slides is almost exactly like mine. So. Uh, you know, the Lancet came out with a special issue. Um, it was rolled out with a lot of fanfare and attention and press releases. It was uh, released at the Global AIDS Conference. It was in Melbourne that year. It was, you know, one of the most visible uh, pieces of that large conference. And uh, the, the special edition was funded by the, uh, the Gates Foundation. They gave a grant to Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, you know, arguably one of the top programs in the country or the world. Um, so this is, you know, this is very heavy hitters funded by the Gates Foundation to help pull together the state-of-the-art research on this, this very critical question. So, um, and of the seven original research articles and a bunch of commentary and other things, uh, the headline finding from that whole effort, that whole edition, 
was the one that got mentioned twice already today, which is if you decriminalize uh, sex work, it will uh, reduce HIV transmission by somewhere between 33 and 46 percent, right? So uh, this is a reference for it. You know, it's easy to find. You know, it's uh, Shannon. I'm going to just refer to the Shannon study from here on out, but there's, you know, a bunch of co-authors. Um, so, you know, that's a big deal. That's a very big find. It's very important. And, you know, I looked at it and I thought, wow, that is fantastic. You know, that, that would <laughs> really be a terrific thing uh, if you can ch make a change in the law and have that happen. So, being a researcher, I thought, how did they do it? You know, like, gosh, you know, let's look under the hood and see that's, you know, I was excited about that. So, um, you know, <laughs> definitely I'm certified as a nerd right there, right? <laughs> um, as if it weren't apparent already. Um, so the Lancet, you know, it was a 17-page article in the Lancet. It had a 97-page technical appendix that they, co they published online. And then there was another appendix that Chris Bayer uh, lead author, but it was with the other co-authors. So there's a lot of detail, a lot of documentation. And part of that, again, this is the one article. The original sources that were cited in that one study, there were 302 different research articles. So again, it's very impressive. You know, you look at that and go, man, that's just a mountain of evidence and data that, that is supporting that. Um, so I actually, again, you know, this is the symptoms talking. Um, I actually acquired and read every single one of the 302 articles that they cited. And then to try to chase little questions that I had, I looked at at least 300 additional articles, probably closer to 500 or 1,000 or something like that. But I've been at this for three years, trying to just figure out what they did. And um, so, before I get to, you know, like my issues with it and the, the kinds of things that I think, uh, you know, strengths and weaknesses of the study, uh, I want to just kind of give you a very quick description of what they did, what it is. So what they, uh, the foundation of the study is a HIV transmission forecast model. And we're, I'm not even touching that, I'm not even, I'm assuming it's perfect and I, you know, it's fine. Um, you know, all kinds of indicators. Uh, this is stuff that's been worked out, and these models are really very good. Um, so there's a 10-year forecast of HIV transmission based on data that you can put together. Um, but then what they did, the independent variables are things that got plugged in. And these, this is the what if exercise. What if you, you could change this? What if you could do that? What if you could have improved access to um, so prevention programming or ART or, you know, uh, economies programs, all kinds of things, right? So you can just plug in things. And again, this is what you should be doing, right, these sort of exercises. And what the authors did is they did this exercise in three different cities, uh, Bellarandria, uh, Mombasa, Kenya, and Vancouver, uh, BC, Canada. And um, some of the things that they looked at, they looked at a lot of things, just complicated models. Um, the elimination of sexual and physical violence and harassment of sex workers, um, access to ART, safe work environments, um, the ability of sex workers to collectivize, you know, to form coalitions, groups, advocacy, self-advocacy, um, even to just have a collaborative brothel models. And brothels kind of imply someone's running it and employing them, but these are just, you know, a safe place. They can just go and, and do this. So. Um, you know, condom use, decriminalization. There are three of these slides, and I'm, you know, I don't expect you to read them all or no, but this is just to take a real quick snapshot in your mind. Um, what they did is in these models, they say, well, what, which, which of these factors would have the biggest impact on uh, preventing HIV transmission? And the column to the right is the decriminalization. So they modeled the decriminalization of sex work. And then there's safer work environments. The ICU means inconsistent condom use. So if you eliminate inconsistent condom use, you are talking about universal use of condoms. Um, you know, elimination of client violence and stuff. And again, these are what if exercises. And um, so the, the first, you know, this is just the same thing in another city. And, you know, one thing that's kind of interesting to look at is, you know, 
some of these things have very little impact. In, elimination of inconsistent condom use due to police harassment. So one of the arguments against criminalizing sex work is that police can basically shake people down and harass them, and they can and will, they do this in some jurisdictions in the US, they do it too, where if you have a bunch of condoms on you, that is evidence of illegal behavior and it can be used against you, so it's a disincentive for carrying condoms. So, you know, it's pretty straightforward, pretty obvious that it's not a good idea to, to have this sort of law enforcement approach. Um, I, it, to, you know, to me, just so like a little reaction, it's like, wow, that's low. Like, you know, it's, it seems like it would be a really terrific thing and a big deal if you could eliminate police um, harassing sex workers, right? And wouldn't that be a useful thing? And it, it had no impact, according to this model. But decriminalization had a huge impact. So then you go to this one, and it's, a, you know, much more evenly spread out. You'll notice that there are fewer things. These models are not exactly the same in the two countries. I'm not going to get all wonky on you and statistical and dive into the fine print. But again, just take kind of a snapshot here. And this one looks more like the first one. This is the one in Bellary. Safe work environments and decriminalization are the two things that just jump off the page as those are the things that, that are real helpful. Um, now, I, I mentioned that these models aren't really the same. Like, they didn't do the same thing in three places. Now, some of that is an adaptation of the fact these are different places and you don't have the same data available, so, you know, go with it. Um, but actually, they're really different. There are only two things that actually show up in all three, and that's safe work environment and decriminalization. All right, so there, you know, there's a lot of different stuff going on here. But you know, when, when they went through all the data, and there are 300 sources, and their literature, and then their statistics, and their forecast model, and they plug all these things in in all kinds of different ways, this is their conclusion. This is what was the headline from the Global AIDS uh, Conference, which is decriminalization would have the greatest effect reducing 33 to 46%, and you know, this has been brought up before. Um, and this is, you know, just another assertion about it. This is during the press conference in Melbourne where they said governments and policymakers can no longer ignore the evidence. So this is not equivocal. Usually, you know, they, you know, people say things like, I would, you know, I'd love to see a one-handed economist, right? Because they're always saying, well, on the one hand, this, on the one hand, you know, equivocating and qualifying and all that, and everyone just like, just shut up and tell me what you think, right? Well, they did. They shut up and said, this is it. You know, we, we got the answer and there it is. Um, uh, here's another one. Now, this is a little more detailed because, you know, again, uh, me the nerd, I'm just like, how did they measure decriminalization? You know, I immediately thought, okay, they must have looked country to country, coded, you know, whether it was criminalized or not. Um, maybe some countries where you look over time and you change the law. So I'm, I'm, you know, I was very curious about what is the thing that they plugged in that represented decriminalization. Um, so here's kind of a hint to what they did. Um, and these are just more, this is in the text of that main article, uh, that decriminalization would have this impact on HIV transmission by the combined effects of uh, reducing violence, pre police harassment, safer work environments, and HIV transmission pathways. So it's like, well, wait a second, maybe it's not a comparative thing, you know, decriminalization compared to all the other things. Maybe it looks like they're, th they're looking at decriminalization as if it's a combination of many of those things. So um, here's another statement, you know, and this is the same idea. It's immediate and sustained effects on violence, police harassment, and safe, safe work environments. So me with my justice background, the, a red flag that went up for me when I read this is I said, wait a second, immediate. You know, you, you, you change the law. Okay, the state legislature takes a vote and they say, okay, it's, we've changed the law. It's decriminalized now. Things don't happen like that. You know, I mean, I, it just in my experience, and again, I've been doing criminal justice research for a long time. So immediate and sustained effects on all of these things. And I'm thinking, well, okay, let's, let's see how they got there. Um, and that's where you start diving into their 300 sources that they cite. Um, now, this, this is a very consequential study. This, you know, what, I didn't just decide, you know, I've got an agenda of my own and I'm going to try to undermine this argument, so let's find a weak study and just beat it to death and then just try to undermine an agenda, right? This is presented as the state-of-the-art capstone event of decades of research. So, um, and it was received that way and it was presented that way by the authors and they're basically saying the evidence is in. 
we're done here. You know, we figured this out. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, many of the UN, you know, components of the UN, UNESCO, UNAIDS, uh, Health Organization, AMA, Human Rights Watch, Soros Foundation, The Gates, Economist, you know, all of these things, they're all just, you know, reposting things and saying, wow, this is terrific. We've got this, this data that, that affirms our position that, uh, that decriminalization is the way to go. Um, Amnesty International, this was probably the single most important thing that tipped the scale in favor of them, decrim you know, adopting decriminalization as their global policy for, for amnesty. So it's a big deal. You know, very few studies have this kind of a, a real world impact on changing policy. And when you change policy and law, then you're changing life experiences on the, on the street level. So, and then the Lancet. Now the Lancet, you know, they not only had a whole special edition where this was, you know, their whole thing, but again, this, this was shown earlier today. This is so definitive that they're saying myths versus facts, right? You know, the fact, you know, so the myth criminalizing is a, is a good idea, right? That, that's a myth. And um, if you decriminalize, and see that range there, 33 to 46%. Now, when you see a range, like they say, well, you know, if something will raise global temperatures between one and two degrees or something like that, you th what you think of as a confidence interval or kind of a margin of error, you think that, well, with conservative assumptions, maybe this, and then you have, you know, more optimal assumptions or optimistic assumptions. So that, that's, you know, it's, it, again, there's no equivocation, there's no qualification, there's no explanation. It's just, this is the range, right? Um, so, uh, you know, this is, you know, again, making a real big, this is a big deal. So again, back in, in my little weird nerd world um, where I take science seriously and social science and research seriously, uh, what you expect to see in the process of science is you throw it out there and you have transparent methods and people attack it, not to attack it, but th what they do is they're trying to build more science and get closer and closer to real answers. So you throw it out there and then people look at it and pick it apart and then you do something different and better and you just advance, right? Uh, looking under the hood has not been welcome. <laughs> uh, this has not been a welcome thing, right? Uh, one of the things I looked for many times, including just a couple days ago, was do Google searches and say, Shannon, HIV, Lancet, sex work, uh, critique, review, method. As far as I know, I've not been able to encounter one review of, of this study, and it's been out there for three years now. So this is not something that has drawn uh, criticism or examination or replication or anything. So I decided to go there because, again, I just have issues. Um, so the key question, you know, is that how was it modeled, right? You just, you know, what exactly did you do here? Because you didn't look at laws, you know, what did you do? What assumptions? And were they empirically supported? Again, they got over 300 sources, so I looked in all of them and I tried to find the support for what they did. We assumed the model is solid. We just looked at this one input in particular, decriminalization. So as we tried to unpack it, we looked through, you know, the 97-page appendix and, and all these technical resources and, you know, the counterfactuals, like when you do a study and, it's, you know, there's the, uh, like, uh, treatment and control, things like that. The counterfactuals are kind of like what you're measuring against. Um, and what it looks like, and this is, this is straight from their work. I'm not, this isn't my conceptualization. This is exactly from the study. Um, the counterfactual for decriminalization is access to safer work environments and elimination of non-condom use. This is in Vancouver. Bellary, there's a couple other things. And then in Mombasa, they don't have anything listed, which I hope is a typo or something, you know. But I, if you say you modeled it and you saw in the graph that they say it's the most important factor, you would expect them to explain what the counterfactual was. Um, so when you get, when all said and done, and again, trust me, I've, you know, I, I've, I brought the whole thing with me if you want to look at it, and it's in a binder the old school way, and you can get it online yourself, but, 
when you look through it all and you say, what exactly did they plug into the model that represented decriminalization, this is what they did. So they, they don't have any data at all. There is no data on decriminalization or legal status. What, they, what this is is a simulation, and the simulation is you plug in assumptions. Again, this is standard practice, and it's a terrific thing to do when you don't have great data. And things like global warming, well, what if uh, you know, carbon emissions decline by 10%, what will that do? That, that is this idea. So it's a fine approach. But whether it's good or not, it's garbage in, garbage out. If you have evidence-based things plugged in, you get good evidence things that come out. Um, so this is what they assumed. They assumed that if you decriminalize, violence towards sex workers goes to 0%. Right? And also, these aren't one at a time. These are all at once. Zero. 0% police harassment, right? Now, I'll stop here and just pause for a moment. Do either one of those things look plausible? I mean, and regardless, you know, we're talking about sex work, which we have all agreed is dangerous. Now, some types and areas are more and less. It's not all, it's very diverse. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a risk environment. I mean, you, find, you don't find 0% violence in any population on the planet, uh, let alone this population, which, by the way, there's a mountain of research on the risk, including the author's own research that finds high violence levels among sex workers. So, again, I, you know, this is the head scratcher from my point of view and why I spent three years chasing down hundreds of other sources. It's like... Can I find support for this? Um, uh, now, police harassment, the argument against criminalization is um, if you look through their work, you can't find one positive thing about criminalization. It's all bad. Not one good thing happens because of it. Um, it you know, stigmatizes and it, it gives a license to abuse and leverage to get, you know, like to essentially rape uh, sex workers. Um, and then in their models, they talk a lot about stigma and culture. And we've all talked a lot about this is huge threads running through how certain people treat other people that have to do with race, class, you know, all kinds of other things. So if you've got all this dysfunction driven by all these really meaty, deep, entrenched things, you change a statute. And I mean, this is, looks like faith healing to me, right? You know, this is almost like, you know, I'm going to change the law and glory, hallelujah, you know, we throw away our crutches and dance, right? How do you go from high oppression and violence to 0% literally overnight? And that is what the model depends upon to get the answer that they got. 100% access to prevention treatment services. Again, I defy you to find a population on earth that has this. And it's not only that it, they're saying that it exists, they're saying it exists because we decriminalize. The switch is the decriminalization will make this happen. 100% access to safe workplaces. Again, I don't have access to a safe workplace. Crap happens where I work, and I'm a researcher <laughs> in a secure building where 40% of the people I work with are PhDs that aren't driven by, well, they're driven by all kinds of bad things. but. Um, they, uh, you know, not the normal drivers of violence, right? Um, so you, you get the point. I'm going to stop, you know, editorializing so much. 100% access to collectives. Now, the, in some places, they say 100% condom use. We're going to eliminate non-condom use. We're going to eliminate inconsistent condom use. That, they say that in some places. In other places, they say the maximum possible. So what they do is they take kind of a baseline, the highest condom use levels that they've encountered, and said, let's assume that decriminalization will produce that, right? And then, so th this is really kind of the model they're working at. You know, and again, this is my conceptual. They have a model that's a little more complicated. It's kind of recursive feedback loops and stuff. But, you know, basically they're saying, you know, decriminalization will do these things that improve condom use and treatment and access to services, which in turn will reduce HIV. That, that's, that's what they're saying. And five minutes. Um, it says here six minutes and 32 seconds, so I'm going to use every bit of it. Um, I'm sorry, that should be more cooperative. Um, 
so anyway, uh, now, you know, from that, you know, after the Red Arrow, the police abuse, violence, you know, I'm 100% on board with all of that. Those are all bad things. No sex worker should be treated like a criminal ever. It's all dysfunctional. It, there's nothing good about arresting people that are sex workers of any age, race, location. It's just, it, it's a bad thing. But the full decriminalization talks about, uh, you know, pimps, managers, uh, um, buyers, all of that, including buyers, you know, um, <laughs> if you look in the research, you can find there's kind of not universal support for even criminalizing the buyers of sex with children. Um, so this is the model, and uh, the conclusion of our review um, is that Shannon Stead did not find the decriminalization has anything, you know, they didn't find anything about decriminalization and its impact on HIV because they didn't study it. Uh, what they studied was if you had a whole bunch of fantastic changes happen all at once, um, HIV transmission would decline. And hey, no problem with that. You know, you get to 100% condom use, I'm sure that would be helpful. You know, I don't think that's exactly news, but I'm not going to argue with it, right? When you try to connect the dots between the change in the law and that happening is where I'm not seeing them having made that case. Um, they don't have any data for it directly, which they could. There were actually the year before their study came out, there were two studies that did these cross-national uh, things. And there's one study that came out since theirs, which actually supports their argument. There is a study that does do cross-national comparisons, and, and it did find that HIV transmission was slightly lower, um, but it's got a lot of issues, but, but you know, I mean, it's there. Um, you know, that collection of things that they assume will happen from decriminalization are unprecedented. They've never happened anywhere ever. Um, so I just don't understand why you would build a model on it. Um, uh, so, you know, th did they make the argument that uh, decriminalization is a necessary condition for any of those things to happen? And uh, they didn't. I mean, um, in fact, there's contradictory evidence in their own research where they have done things like, let's look at, um, you know, the Ahaven program, Bellary, one of their study sites. They went from the 20s to over 90% in condom use rate. The law didn't change at all. The law stayed exactly the same. They just put resources into programming and elevated condom use that much. So, I mean, do you need to change the law to get those things to happen? No. Um, uh, reductions in police abuse, you know, again, like, I will have no argument at all with uh, all of the bad things that happen with police abuse and all that, but um, do you need to decriminalize that in order to improve their behavior? And of course not. You know, there's litigation, programming, accountability, management. There's all kinds of things you can do to get police to stop being abusive idiots. Um, there's no evidence. Is it a sufficient condition? Um, no, they didn't really demonstrate anything. Uh, you know, any of, the, any of the assumptions are not demonstrated in their study. Um, and... Uh, you know, so you kind of. This is a real big one. Okay, let, let's just say, let's say you have the evidence that you know, um, through reducing stigma in the long run and this and that, you know, uh, maybe it would produce good outcomes. And okay, fine. The immediate part is a real big problem because to get to that thirty-three to forty-six percent means you're you, you're assuming immediate full impact, right? and not a one or two or three year run up to try to get everything to change after that. Again, it, this would be unprecedented. It's never happened. Mountains of research in criminal justice showing you that when you change the law, you need training programs, you need prosecutors, you need police, you need uh, you know, social workers, first responders, you know, everyone to basically get up to speed on the new way that we're handling something. And in fact, the authors don't believe it either. I got one minute and 48 seconds. Um, a subsequent article published by these, uh, these authors said, well, considering the change of the law, we need to proceed to the data of HIV estimates and uh, slow dynamic beta is not probable to expect that any changes in the law would have an immediate effect on HIV prevalence. 
so I don't, you know, I, I really am kind of speechless here. You know, it's sort of like they build the model assuming immediate full impact, which I just do not think is a sane thing to, to assume. And then they write later that, of course, that can't happen. It takes time. So um, they didn't look at unintended consequences, offsets. And, and even if they end up at the same answer they start with, you should at least bring things up and kind of like work them through. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of things that, you know, I'm running out of time, so. Um, you know, for one thing, the decriminalization is not gonna affect a huge and problematic part, part of the market, which is underage prostitution. Um, and the other thing is in the research we did with, uh, with I did a bunch of interviews with incarcerated human, uh, convicted human traffickers, and I asked them, would, would you, um, you know, being a sex trafficker, would that be easier or harder for you if prostitution were decriminalized? And 100% of convicted sex traffickers would love it if prostitution were decriminalized. And I think you at least need to stop and think a little bit when you're handing sex trafficker is exactly the policy framework that they would love to have. Um, it's at least, you know, should elicit a conversation. This is the last one. Um, again, this is, part of it is like, if, if you want to just say what we did was kind of set a theoretical maximum, if what we do is try to set, we're going to establish a range of likelihood that decriminalization uh, could produce certain outcomes. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk it out and just say, if we just like, you know, have fantasy levels of positive outcomes, no negative offsets, no unintended consequences, no lag, no delay, all of that, let's set the bar here. That's part of a good study, but then you would say, what if we kind of had like what we really think would happen? And then let's have kind of like modest or pessimistic assumptions and produce a range. When they present it like 33 to 46%, it looks like that range, and it's not. This is three different cities with fantasy world positive outcomes only. And they don't say, you know what, with every assumption leaning in favor of maximum impact, you may get up to those ranges. What they do is they say, if you decriminalize, you'll find something happen between this range. So to me, you know, even if, you know, it just in terms of how science gets used, how research gets used, no research is perfect. You can poke holes in anything. Um, but I think, it, you know, like there's a responsibility if you're inserting stuff directly into consequential policy and law discussions. You should qualify it, not, you know, to the nth degree for every nerdy little quirky thing, but this is, this is big ticket stuff. This isn't like a little esoteric debate among pinheads. You know, this is like, we built this on these assumptions. Let's be very clear about that, which they weren't. And we are never gonna present this as the likely range. What we're gonna do is just make sure that when we say this range, these are just insanely optimistic possibilities. The likely range is, is gonna be far less than that, so. I'm over by two minutes, and thank you for your restraint. Um, you, you, uh, yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah, sir. I know. I saw your hand. I'm sorry. I had to ignore your toes. Me? Is this on? Great. Um, so I hope you, I, I'm not going to apologize. I'm a journalist. I also fact check for a living. Mm. It's my bread and butter. Um, I wouldn't be worth my salt if I didn't do it. So I'm going to do it back at you. Sure. Sorry. Yeah. Not sorry. Um, so I'll take accountability for this as a journalist. If the headline on the Lancet study was this particular finding, and there were many other findings, they did a uh, they did a cross analysis of 700 or something different studies relating to sex work and health. Mm -hmm. But if journalists chose this one and seized upon this one, maybe that was Lancet's media strategy, which is not actually on the researchers. And that's also on journalists who ran with it. And I can say as a journalist, there's a lot of studies mm -hmm. all the time, you go for the simple data point. This is a multifaceted, there's, a multi, there's multiple reasons why this was made the headline. Second, um, as somebody who followed the Amnesty International policy development debate for multiple years, at least back since 2013, 
That was a multi-year effort to change their policy and approach on the human rights of sex workers. And at the time the Lancet study was publicized, they were already engaged in research in three right. different regions. And the scope of that research actually went far beyond HIV. And they came to their policy decision so shortly after this came out that I find it hard to believe that this was like the tipping point, particularly from the conversations I had with people within Amnesty. It may have been important, but they had been working on this for years. Um, and I would also say that what was lost in your presentation is this is about people's real lives. I know you said this isn't a pinhead, wonky thing. This isn't just an abstract question of data. And we know that in other areas of criminal law, like criminalizing drug use and criminalizing same-sex relationships, we know that those things also create dangerous conditions for people who use drugs and for LGBT people. And a study or your debunking of a study is just another two data points in a much larger multi-decade effort to do better research on sex work and improve the lives of people who've engaged in and traded sex. So what I'm actually seeing in all of that is there's agreement here. The agreement is to achieve better health and rights for people engaged in the sex trades, it will require a multi-pronged approach. You see that reflected in some of the criteria that they looked at. Like if, the, if there were changes in these areas, we would see better outcomes overall. The study points to that. So does a lot of other research. And so do sex workers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most important thing at the end of the day. This isn't about, is it gonna be a 33% reduction? Is it gonna be a 44% reduction? That's just one data point in a much larger conversation. And so I just question why you spent so much time debunking one very narrow thing, when it actually seems like there's a lot of agreement in this room that criminalization is dangerous, and you mm -hmm. agree with that yourself. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. OK, well, boy. Okay, um, I, I've got, well, there are a lot of statements and four or five questions in there. So I'll, I'll try to just deal with a couple. The, um, First of all, like, um, you know, the characterization of debunking is not what I was doing. I mean, I, I'm, I didn't set out to say, boy, I'm going to go show them that they're wrong. What I did was I rolled up my sleeves, I dug in and said, what did they do and what did they really find? And the fact that I can't find any support for their conclusion, and I find, in fact, a lot of contradictions even their, in their own body of work for the assumptions that they needed or, or that they used, to end up with the estimate that they produced, um, you could call it debunking just because I'm saying they didn't do it. You know, I did, it's they didn't an attempt accomplish to debunking. It. Let's agree, sure. Whatever. I, okay. Okay. Fine. Oh, yes, I was. Um, I don't know. Anyway, we can you know, we can debate about like what to call what I did. I did critically review the methods, and I found them to be lacking in a lot of ways that undermines the credibility of the finding. Um, I don't think it's an inconsequential thing to, you know, when you say 33 or 46 percent. The thing is, with a much more balanced set of assumptions, um, a much more balanced set of inputs into the model that are not all positive and all maximum to the point of being just not possible, um, we don't know if there's any HIV prevention benefit decriminalizing by itself, just changing the law. Um, all Based kinds of on other this things. study, but we do know from others, and that's the point that I'm trying well, to make. Why they, focus so much on this one piece in a much broader conversation? Yeah, okay. There's something I'm going to agree with you with, definitely, is that I am not taking on the whole issue. I'm not trying to undermine the argument. I'm not going to argue with anyone about the issue, will decriminalization um, reduce HIV transmission. That's not what I was doing. What I was doing was looking at a study that asserted they have demonstrated that link. And that study, which has been used, in fact, people in this room used it in their presentations to talk about why it's important to decriminalize. So it is a, it's a relevant study. It's an important study. It was presented as kind of a capstone, state-of-the-art culmination of studies. So you would expect to see that the best went into it. And I looked there, and I do not see that, that it worked out. I, I don't see the, the good science or the responsible uh, discussion of, of the findings. So again, it's super narrow, and I'm, I'm actually not, you know, you ask why would I do that? Well, I'm a researcher, you know, and this is something that is being used. Is it credible? That study done the way it was 
is is not it, according to just like looking at the science. Uh, Even though you okay, so I'm going to jump in and say thank decreasing. you to everybody. I think we've yeah. given a um, uh, a reasonable amount of bonus time. Um, uh, and, and not just to cut it off for cutting it off sake, but I, we also value the time of our final speaker and want to make sure that he's able to um, give us a message which I think will integrate well with all of the things that we are wrestling with. And we know that we are still grappling with um, all of these questions, which is exactly why we're here, is to try to put our best efforts and our best thoughts uh, into all of, all of these. Um, so Jeff Temple, I'm pleased to be able to introduce him um, because he's a professor, licensed psychologist, and director of behavioral health and research in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Texas Medical Branch. His research focuses on interpersonal relationships with a particular focus on adolescents. Temple has been awarded multiple research grants from the National Institute of Justice, National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, he has more than 125 scholarly publications in a variety of high-impact journals, including JAMA, JAMA Pediatrics, the Journal of Youth and Adolescence Pediatrics, and the Journal of Adolescent Health. He is an associate editor for the Journal of Primary Prevention and a senior consulting editor for the Psychology of Violence. Um, and he is, uh, I will also say, now on the board of directors of the Texas Psychological Association and the vice president of the Galveston Independent School District Board of Trustees. So welcome. Dr. Temple. All right, I will not keep you from getting a beer or working or doing both. I promise to be done by three. Thank you, Michael, for leaving me so much time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I want to uh, thinking that that we were the last two because she, Dr. Rothman wanted to save the best for last, but I think it was more just putting white middle-aged males in their place. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, I also really uh, uh, like the fact that it is interdisciplinary. So thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dr. Rothman, for having this. Usually I'm, I'm in a room full of psychologists. So that means in a room full of people who think they know everything. And now I am just one of those people who knows everything, thinks, thinks he knows everything. All right. So uh, all right, how do I do this? Which button? Nope. There we go. All right, so I, I have a little bit easier of a task here because I don't have to really take a stand on criminalization or decriminalization or legalization because I'm talking about minors and adolescents and I think we can all agree that that is and will always be illegal and uh, no adolescent, it, while I give adolescents a lot of credit and give them agency, they don't have the choice to select being a sex worker uh, there's a lot of factors that goes into that, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, whatever, whatever we talk about, this is important, and so this is just a few caveats before I move on, is that criminal sanctions against human trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation, exploitation of minors are essential, but the laws must clearly differentiate this from sex work with adults. And I think oftentimes when we see things like anti-trafficking laws and it, it really uses adolescence as a red herring to really just be anti-prostitution and anti-sex work. So I think we have to be careful about that, about introducing those loopholes. Also, I'm going to channel President Hillary Clinton here. And uh, she is president, right? Because there's no way that uh, is uh, <laughs> sex worker rights are human rights, and human rights are sex worker rights. So I want to throw that caveat there. And then prosecution of people under 18 as criminal offenders is dumb. And Bobby used dumb in your presentation, so I felt like I could as well. And it really is stupid and misguided. And when we do that, uh, you know, they're already having a difficult life. If they're, if they're in sex work under 18, they already have many problems going on and many risky back factors, probably experience trauma, and those they have to be dealt with other than uh, criminally. And also, when we do this, we introduce things like uh, racism into the factor because white people are less likely to be held criminally accountable than African American and Hispanic. Uh, so should be treated as victims and provided resources. And, and the providing resources is really important. So California is, and probably some other states, but you cannot be uh, held as criminally negligent in California if you're under 18 and selling sex. Uh, 
but I still think they have a long way to go in providing the type of resources and education and mental health to those folks that are that are in those situations. Okay, so the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we shouldn't be scared of adolescent sex, that adolescents are going to have sex, and, uh, and then I'm going to go back to a little bit more about uh, sex work in adolescence and uh, and where we go from here and what we do. So I do work on uh, inter inter intimate partner violence, dating violence. I have a study, a uh, longitudinal study that we've been doing now for eight years. It's called Dating It Safe, and we started with about a thousand kids when they were freshmen in high school, and I've been following them now. So now they're about 22, 23 years old, funded by the National Institute of Justice and National Institute of Health, and really cool data because not only is it longitudinal, and following these kids from when they first get into relationships to when they're in more serious relationships and maybe even have kids of their own. But we're also taking the sample post high school, some that go to college, some that don't. Because a lot of the existing longitudinal studies stop at high, after high school or they begin again in college and they miss a lot of those folks that are going into the workforce, military, or not having a job at all. So really neat stuff. Found some really cool uh, results with our studies. We looked at longitudinal relationship between substance use and dating violence, the long-term association between risky sexual behavior and dating violence, and e-cigarettes, and synthetic marijuana, and firearm research, a really whole bunch of cool stuff, but really all anyone ever cares about, and I know there's a media person here, so thank you, is, uh, is my research on sexting, because it involves teens and sex, and in fact, what happened with this research we published in 2012 in JAMA Pediatrics, uh, it picked up like amazingly crazy with with respect to media. So uh, our media team at the time, I don't know how they factor in this. They use the models, I guess. Said about over 600 million people worldwide saw this study, and uh, at the time it was in. So within a year, I was uh, on CNN and BBC and all this stuff, and now I'm known as kind of a sexting guy. And if you Google me. You'll see pictures of naked people, so you could look look my name up for as a safe way to look at porn at work, and, uh, and so so this happened. So I, you know, so all this we kind of cornered the market there at the time. UTMB, where I am, said it was the most media reach they've ever had of any study up until uh, the Ebola thing happened a couple of years ago. So we have the Time Magazine had the the people of the year was the Ebola fighters, or one of those was our guys at UTMB. And so then that guy stole all of my thunder, right? And so what I was really, really hoping was that that person, that nurse in Maine, remember, who was quarantined, that she would have sexted someone? And we could have really cornered the market. Uh, would have been great. Didn't happen, though. It was weird. Uh, another really quick story, and I know that I don't have a whole heck of a lot of time, but it is my favorite story about this episode in my life, is uh, I did this media tour right after because, again, it's teens and sex, and people don't like to think about that. <laughs> Uh, are really interested in it is uh, I was talking to it was on on live radio with someone in Atlanta I was on the phone he went into a huge monologue about what I was there to talk about right and so he's he's talking he tells a story about a teen that falls on the basketball court his mom takes him to the hospital uh, gets released he has a cut or whatever gets released and he ends up dying and I'm thinking, what the hell does this have to do with sexting, right? I'm like, I have no idea. And I'm sitting there just waiting to, to talk. And about a minute into it, I'm like, oh, he thinks I'm here to talk about sepsis. And so, so he gets back to me and he says, so, Doc, what do you think of that? And I'm like, man, uh, sounds bad. Uh, but I'm a psychologist. I don't like blood at all. Um, all right. So I also ended up in The Onion which is, I think, a real show that I made it. You can see my, the last quote on there. I'll, uh, this is about the, my longitudinal study. And the uh, last one is, I bet all the dorks don't even know about sexting yet and are out still having sex like a bunch of lamos. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's I, I made it, right? I, I should quit. Uh, all right, so here just really quickly, uh, I, I'm going to show the results just because I teased you guys. But we, we saw about 28% of boys and girls were sending a naked picture of themselves. Uh, if they had been asked, boys were more likely to ask. Uh, about 70% of girls had been asked. So if you have a teenage daughter, chances are her friend was asked, not, not your teenage daughter. Uh, 
And then this is why I made up these questions, which I should have said earlier about sexting. It was nothing was done before yet, and it was I was uh, making questions for the next year of my interview, and there was something on the news about how sexting was going to destroy this generation, and everyone was going to die because of sexting. And I wanted to do some research on it, so I made up a few questions. And this is why it's stupid to make up a few questions in your hotel room when you have nothing else to do, is because that last question is really stupid. Bothered by requests for sex? Well, you can see that, yeah, it looks like a lot of people were bothered, boys and girls, but what I, don't, I didn't define bothered, so I don't know if they were annoyed uh, or harassed or embarrassed. I also didn't ask who they were bothered by. They might have been cool when the quarterback asked them, but not so cool when the creepy guy in math class asked them. Uh, no offense, Michael. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, so, uh, all right, so, th so that's that. Uh, kind of the meat and potatoes of it, if they sexted, they were more likely to have sex. And that's uh, the benefit of being the first person to publish on this, means that you get to publish that in a really good journal. Uh, and that's pretty obvious. So then we started to look at whether or not it was related to health, and it's not really related to a whole bunch of negative health consequences. And so it got me thinking that when I first approached it, I approached it as kind of a risky behavior. The sexting is a risky behavior. We need to do stuff to prevent it. And then I think I started to, then we did longitudinal study, and this is my favorite cartoon ever. I'm not going to keep it up for too long. Uh, there you go. And, uh, and so basically what we found was that in some cases, sexting preceded actual sexual behavior, right? And, and anyway, I, got, I thought, thank you. I think someone just got it. Uh, and uh, so I, I started to, to think more that may, maybe this is just like real sex, that adolescents have sex. And adolescents are going to sext, just like we showed people we got, you know, back in the day with Polaroids, but we had time. And, uh, or didn't even have Polaroids, just did it. And so I started to think more about that and more about sex and teens. And uh, I, did, I published this, but I'm going to go fast since I only have a few minutes. And basically, teens think about sex a lot. <laughs> teens have sex a fair amount. Teens are going to continue having sex, and us telling them not to is not going to make them stop having sex. So we need to change our focus, right? And we need to start thinking about preventing unwanted, trafficked, and unsafe sex and promoting healthy relationships and po sex-positive relationships even among teens. Because we do, right? We talk to them like, man, it's, uh, uh, just don't have sex. It's bad. You're going to get STDs. You're going to get pregnant. And then all the while, all they see is us talking about how great sex is or them watching how great sex is, right? So we give them these mixed messages, and so treating them like they're asexual and treating them uh, like sex is bad has real-life negative consequences. If you look at pregnancy rates, the states that have abstinence-only education has the highest pregnancy rates. Uh, kids are also that don't, aren't taught how to have safe sex have dangerous sex. So they have anal sex instead of vaginal sex because you can't get pregnant that way. Uh, and so we need to teach them to maybe use a condom, have condoms available. Uh, and then, you know, what risky sex. And, and then I think also just, just talking negative about sex and sex is bad, sex is bad, sex is bad. That inf impacts their future relationships as adults with the kind of sex is kind of important. All right, so how does this affect commercial sex policy? I realize I'm going to be mindful of your couple minutes is uh, – Criminalization, we know, doesn't work, right? There's, uh, every, every year there was a recent study, a recent estimate, and a lot of people in here are smarter than I am about this, so uh, just tell me I'm stupid if I am, but it's about a couple hundred thousand teens in the U.S. annually are, are uh, said to have been trafficked, and, uh, and trafficked is with anyone under the age of 18 is considered trafficked if they're in sex work. What's that? At risk for, yes, sorry, yes. At, so traffic and at so was close. Anyway, uh, so we know criminalization doesn't work here. Decriminalization, we know that s some studies increase, you see increased traffic flow in countries that have decriminalized. And then uh, with legalization, oftentimes what's, what happens is uh, the authorities focus in on regulating the licensed places that they lose focus on some of the illegal activities. So what do we do? And I think what we do is we teach kids from the very beginning about healthy relationships and about, uh, and I'm going to skip this just because of time, but so this is kind of where I, where I hang my hat on 
is that the same kids that are partaking in a bunch of different risky behaviors are uh, oftentimes the ones we need to focus on. And what I think undergirds all of that is relationships. So if we can improve relationships, we can prevent a lot of these risky behaviors. Risky behaviors, by the way, that are related to uh, them being at risk for, uh, for being trafficked. So if we can do this, and we can do it in schools, so we have a program, and I know that I'm out of time, so I'm just gonna say the program is 4th R. 4th uh, R is reading, writing, arithmetic, 4th R being relationships. And so basically it replaces existing health curriculum, which is usually outdated and dumb and tells people the names of STIs and drugs instead of giving them the skills to actually improve the relationships. Because if I asked you guys how many of y'all uh, got information when you were kids on how to be in a healthy relationship, my guess is none of y'all would raise your hand. Uh, and that sucks, right? I mean, this is probably the most important thing in our lives is relationships, and we get zero education about it. Trial and error, we do a pretty good job of it, actually. If you, we gotta give teens credit. 80% of them are not in violent relationships. Most of them are in pretty normal relationships. They do pretty well on their own. Uh, learning from their peers sometimes sucks. Learning from the media definitely sucks. Learning from parents sometimes sucks. Uh, even well-meaning parents, right, that get in conflicts, they often make up away from their kids so their kids don't get to see how to resolve conflicts. Uh, so basically, real quick, fourth R, uh, the, the program, and please just contact me if you want more information. We're doing, a, I, I see your hand, we're doing a, a few studies in the Houston area right now. We're doing implementation stuff in, in high violence areas. I also recently got funded by the NIH to evaluate this program with middle school students. So we're doing it in 12 schools or getting the program. We're actually training them this Friday. Uh, 12 schools are getting the program, uh, 12 control schools, and we'll follow them for four years, hoping that our kids that got it will have reduced risky behavior, less violence, less substance use, less risky sex, uh, and increased communication, assertiveness, all those kind of relationship skills that are so important. And I am gonna skip through that and just say that that's me, and there's my information if you want, and I wanna answer at least that question. How in those four R's oh, that you put together where um, access to economic resources and poverty fell, especially because um, with the studies based in New York of, of young people who are trading sex, I, I, over 80% of them said they would exit the sex trade with a living wage job and access to education, followed by housing. And the first thing that they, they spent their money on from commercial sex was food to address food instability. So I was just curious whether or not and how um, do those elements played into uh, the development of this program, or, or if you saw that as necessarily a separate um, element that didn't fit into this? I, I think that's a really good question. I've been working with, with a colleague uh, lately, uh, looking at more about kind of the structural determinants and how to make that more part of the program, because that's certainly some of the feedback that we've got in focus groups with kids, is that they'll often talk about racism and, uh, and poverty and that you know, while we spend a, a third of our lives in school, we still go home to these environments and to the community. So no, it's not as much of a part of it as it should be, but we are working on that and making it a, a, a larger part. I will say in, in my work in the, in the schools with school districts, we're doing mandatory, uh, not mandatory, but free meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner as much as possible to try to prevent some of that kind of stuff. But that's just a s small component of what we're doing. But it's a great question, and I think something that we need to work on more. All right, mindful of your time. I'm going to end, but if you have any questions, I'll be, I'll be sticking around. Thank you guys so much. Okay, um, so that concludes today's program, and I just wanted to thank everybody for being here, for your participation. Um, again, to thank the dean for making it possible to have this symposium, and to say that I know um, our work here definitely isn't done, um, and that uh, hopefully there'll be some kind of part two in whatever form that takes so that we can all keep uh, thinking and puzzling over these things together. So thank you, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.